welcome to podcast number eight, which is titled Hermetic Kabbalah, part three, Nefesh. It's just after midday today on the 7th of February 2007. In the last podcast, I discussed the important features of the part Sufi known as Nakash, the intelligence which is represented in Hermetic Kabbalah, in modern Hermetic Kabbalah, as a seven-headed red dragon. And it is positioned, usually, on the Tree of Life, below the lowest sphere on the tree, which is the sphere of Malkuth. In Freemasonry, which was the womb of the modern Hermetic tradition, the Nakash effect is found in the symbolism of the death of the Master Mason, which any guy who has completed his third degree in Blue Lodge or Craft Masonry will be very aware of the symbolism of the death of the Master Mason. In the alchemical tradition, the Nakash force is putrefaction, or sometimes referred to as fermentation, which divides the primordial unity and maintains that separation. It is the state of the philosophical sun being buried in the caverns of the earth, and it is the task of the alchemist to draw out that sun into the light of day. The Nakash is also the black crow of the alchemists, the hermetic sun at midnight. In human biology, the Nakash is found at the very core of our organic body, in the spine and in the very center of the brain, the, the very central part of the human brain, which is known as the reptilian brain. In ancient Egyptian esoteric art, this side of the human condition is sometimes depicted as a serpent standing on two legs or walking on two legs, the man serpent. While at the same time, a successful initiate in the ancient mystery tradition was sometimes depicted as a walking serpent with wings. For this reason, we also sometimes see depictions of men with wings, and they represent the same thing. And we see this same symbolic representation on the sarcophagi of some of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, where they have wings extending from their arms, and their arms are wrapped around their torsos. This represents the fact that that king in particular was the embodiment in his life of an illuminated being. As I've discussed in previous podcasts, the Kabbalistic diagram, which is referred to as the Tree of Life, is a great tool for aiding us in the visualization symbolically of the structure of the mind and of the relationships between its various parts. Nakash is placed on this diagram underneath the lowest sphere of the tree and that lowest sphere represents the physical universe or what is known as Malkut, the, the world of action. Nakash is below that sphere because it represents the very primordial, the very original prototypical forces which allow the physical universe to come into being. And that is the force of separation, of the establishment of a binary. So in this way, Nakash is the fertile soil from which the physical universe springs. Out of this most ancient 
level of the human mind and most ancient level of the universe, Nakash, eventually evolved the Nefesh or unconscious mind. And notice that I say unconscious mind, not subconscious mind, a term promoted by the pop psychology of Hollywood movies. But the mind, this part of the mind is technically known as the unconscious because everything inside of it we are completely unaware of, unconscious of. The term subconscious mind is something completely different and we'll discuss that in a later podcast. About 90% of what the human mind contains is contained inside the nefesh or the unconscious mind and only 10% is what we are consciously aware of or roughly 10%. We have to remember now that nefesh like nakash is an individual intelligent entity, an intelligent evolving complex of information that exists within the human psyche. On the tree of life, the, Naka, uh, the nefesh spans two spheres, the two lowest spheres on the tree. And her head rests in the sphere which is labelled in Hebrew, Yeshod and which is translated into English as foundation, telling us that the function of the unconscious mind is the foundation of physical reality, our external world. Nakash, which is the core of binary mechanics, makes physical existence possible through separation. Nefesh is the foundation out of which physical reality is constructed. She is the raw building material, the bricks and mortar upon which all physical matter is constructed. And the ancient alchemists called her the spiritus mundi or the spirit of the world because of this function of being the stuff out of which physical reality is built. The feet of Nefesh stand on the lowest sphere of the tree, Malkut. And Malkut translates from Hebrew as world of action. And we can roughly transliterate that into the physical world or the temporal universe. This symbolically refers to the fact that because Nefesh is the building blocks of material reality, physical reality, she stands on physical reality as her foundation. The physical world is literally the hard copy of the unconscious mind. So I often um, uh, vocalize that situation in the phrase inside is outside. In the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, this idea is represented by the famous phrase as above, so below, or as in the mind, so it is in the physical reality. So the physical world is literally an extension of the unconscious mind. Between the spheres of foundation and physical reality is a pathway. And this path is referred to as the 32nd path of the tree of life. In modern Hermetic Kabbalah attributes the concept of 
Saturn to this path. The three primary concepts that are associated with the idea Saturn are number one, the mundanity of reality, its grossness, and number two, putrefaction, death, and decomposition. And thirdly, time and space. And of course these three concepts are tied closely together and they are all represented by the idea of Saturn. For this reason the old alchemists, when they were symbolically referring to the crude matter or the, uh, the very first substance that they took in hand to begin the great work of alchemy to make the Philosopher's Stone, they often referred to that crude substance as Saturn. And sometimes by the name of the, the semi-metal antimony. And it's because both Saturn and antimony are connected with the lower sphere on the tree of life and with the 32nd path between Yeshod and Malkuth because that path represents the actual extension out of the unconscious mind of the substances which come together to form physical matter. After the primordial unity divided itself from itself and unfolded downward into physical reality, two conditions of existence, two poles of binary mechanics rule over the conditions of the temporal universe. These two poles of temporal mechanics are known in Kabbalah as Nefesh and Ruach. So they are the two extreme ends of the spectrum which govern the mechanics of physical reality. Nefesh is the female pole of that binary and in Kabbalah she has a number of different titles or names which she is referred to by and the first one of those is Kala which translates as bride and she's referred to as the bride because she is the consort or partner of the male pole of binary reality. Also the Kabbalists and alchemists both referred to Nefesh um, as the queen and the Hebrew label for her in that under those conditions is uh, Malkar. So here we see uh, we begin to see a relationship existing between the way the alchemists thought about things and their philosophy and the way the Kabbalists thought about things and their philosophy. That between Kabbalistic and alchemical terminology there is a crossing over happening here. And, and this is a, an important concept that I'll come back to a number of times because that crossover is a crossover between human psychology or esoteric psychology which is what Kabbalah primarily concerns itself with and physical reality, chemistry and physical and physics, physical mechanics, uh, which is primarily what um, traditional alchemy deals with. As I said previously, Nefesh extends from the sphere of Yeshod down to the sphere of Malkuth, from the foundation, the unconscious mind, to the physical world. And between those two spheres, is the 32, 32nd path of the tree of life. In the tarot system, which was established by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, um, and which is today probably the most popular system of tarot to work with, especially where Kabbalah is concerned. Each path on the tree of life has one of the major arcana tarot cards attributed to it and the card which is attributed to the 32nd path 
is symbolized by the 21st major arcana tarot card which title is the the world and we can see in the central image of that card uh, the figure of Nefesh and she's standing up with her arms slightly raised and in each hand she is holding what looks like a baton and these two batons represent the two poles of the binary dynamic which is responsible for creating physical reality. So in the Nefesh these two poles are functioning or operating and remember that division those two poles were set into motion or um, are personified by Nakash. In the four corners of the world card we see a man, an eagle, a lion and a bull and these are the traditional modern symbols for the four alchemical elements and the four alchemical elements are the things upon which all substances in physical reality are founded. They are the building blocks, the four elements are the building blocks of all things in physical reality. Nefesh is also represented in the tarot by the second major arcana card which is titled the High Priestess and we can see in this card uh, two of the main symbols are the two pillars which uh, flank her on the left and right. One black pillar and one white pillar and they have the letters J and B on them and these letters stand for the Hebrew names Yakin and Boaz and um, they are two figures out of the Old Testament and these two pillars were said to stand on the porchway flanking each side of the door which led into Solomon's temple. These two pillars again like the two batons in the world card represent the two primary binary forces which are responsible for physical existence and which are maintained by the Nakash. So these two pillars flank the entrance to the temple of the ancient mysteries and to Solomon's temple and Nakash is down below Malkuth down below the Nefesh because he guards the gateway to the temple. He's the guardian of the mysteries who holds the key to the entrance to the temple of the ancient mysteries. We also see in that tarot card Nefesh with her foot on the moon. Slightly different use of the symbolism but it's basically saying that she is a lunar intelligence which is equally true she is a lunar intelligence. So as I said previously uh, Nefesh is the feminine pole of the lower binary the binary dynamic which governs the functions the mechanics of physical reality and as the feminine pole she is a receptacle by nature a container um, which is one of the reasons why we use the word feminine because she is like a womb and in her role as receptacle or container she contains the other five primary parts of them and she contains all of the um, smaller or uh, uh, secondary intelligences of the mind so she contains all the intellectual functions. She is not those functions herself, but she contains them like a vessel. Uh, in her role as receptacle and container, she also records and stores all of the memories of humanity. On an individual level, that means as the unconscious mind, she's the container of all of your individual experiences. 
every smell, every taste, every sight, every sound, every feeling that you have in your life, she's recording all of those things perfectly and storing them in the unconscious mind which she is. On a collective level, on the collective level of humanity, she is the collective unconscious and she stores all of the memories of the entire human race since the first Homo sapiens all the way up to our present stage of human evolution. So she is also the collective unconscious and the receptacle of the collective memory of the human race. I also mentioned previously that the physical world is the hard copy of the software which is stored in the unconscious mind. And uh, in there is a dynamic which exists between the unconscious mind and the physical world, represented by the 30-second path on the tree of life, which modern psychology refers to as projection, in that what we contain in our own personal unconscious, in our own nefesh, causes us to see the world in a particular way, different than all the other people around us see the world. All of our uh, perception of the world, our interpretation of what is happening in the world, we project our own way of analysing all of that stuff onto the outer, outer world. So modern psychology calls this a projection. Hermetic adepts though do not see this projection as a metaphor or as a subjective um, simply analysing or interpreting the world. Hermetism sees the outer world as a literal extension of or projection of the unconscious mind. So for example, all younger females in human society and all immature females are actually the nefesh of the collective human race manifest in the physical world. Similarly, all males, all younger human males and immature human males are the manifestation of the collective human ruach, the male and female binary situation. When we look at a female in society, a younger female or an immature female, we're actually looking at a node or a sub-personality of the collective human nefesh. And when I say uh, collective human nefesh, we have to remember that Adam Cadman in Kabbalah represents the archetype of the human race. If we bunched all human beings together that are living on the planet today, and made one human being out of all of them, in other words, each individual person's characteristics all meld together to create one human, Kabbalists revert to that collective entity as Adam Cadman. And just like individual human beings have a nefesh and a ruach inside of them, Adam Cadman also has a nefesh and ruach. So Adam Cadman's nefesh projected or extended out of the collective unconscious into the physical world is all young females and all immature women. So in this way, any woman out there in life is a physical node of humanity's nefesh. When we look at a male in human society, his nefesh is internalized and the closest physical, most immediate representation or manifestation of his nefesh in the physical world is his intimate partner, his lover or girlfriend or his sisters in his family group and younger and immature woman in his immediate social group. So by looking at younger and immature women, we can calculate and gain an understanding of the condition of nefesh in various places in human society. For example, 
the behaviour and activities of a man's wife are a representation for that man of the state of his own nefesh. If we take all younger and immature women in human society as a culture in any particular age in human evolution, take a snapshot of younger and immature women in any time in human culture, that is a representation of the state of Adam Kadman's nefesh at that point in time and space. So just to quickly summarize what I've said here about Nefesh so far, she, the entire physical reality fluctuates between two extreme poles. And we Kabbalists refer to those extreme poles as Nefesh and Ruach. And we have a Nefesh and Ruach internally, and that internal Nefesh and Ruach manifests externally. There is a microcosm and macrocosm relationship here where there is an efficient ruach for the entire human race and for all of physical reality. And there is an efficient ruach biologically for us in our physical bodies and mentally for us in our minds. So these two extreme poles of um, physical existence are referred to by Kabbalists as the Nefesh and Ruach and by alchemists as the alchemical king and queen. Later on in further podcasts we're going to discuss in detail the nature of the dynamic that exists between these two poles but for today I just wanted to pre present um, uh, a slightly more in-depth dis description of just the female pole itself. So in the next podcast, podcast number nine, we're going to look at the male pole of that physical binary relationship, which is known as the Ruach. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you in the next podcast.